today, you could have a great new income stream, owning and controlling your data. Then, is the media finally changing how it reports climate change? And the New York Times, some great insider info. This is Future Forward. I'm Alexis Scordato. I am Steven Rosenbaum, and let us launch. Hey, Alexa, how are you? Hey, Steve, what's up? You know, I'm really excited about today's show because we have three chapters, and they're really different, and they're all cool and chewy and interesting and not grim, although some a little dark, but not some grim. Some are a little. Yeah, a little, bit, a little. <laughs> I don't know if we can escape that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And before I forget, we've got uh, Glenn Zorpat joining us a little bit later in the show to talk about a really cool IEEE article on some interesting responses to what's happening in the California wildfires and some tech that you probably have not heard of. So three chapters. The first, we are going to do climate change and what's changing in media coverage. Second, then we are going to talk about data privacy. And third, we're going to take a look inside the New York Times. So let's begin with climate, shall we? Yeah, so we're going to open with something you wrote, Steve, which is really cool. Yeah, you know, so th this is an article that I wrote in 2013. Um, I wrote it for the Columbia for, Journalism, for Columbia Review. Journalism Review. Uh, and I wrote it with great passion and conviction because I just thought the way mainstream media was covering weather was just criminally negligent. And, and I did the research and I got the graphics and I banged it out and I really thought like, it essentially, what it was about was the way that ABC News in particular was using uh, a young woman who was a storm chaser and replacing facts about what was happening in weather with kind of these salacious tornado coverage, kind of what 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 is known in the industry didn't make it up as weather porn. Um, and so that the article takes us back to 2013, and so I guess summarize for us what you so you thought so was ABC the only culprit? Or they were just the ones who were like the most, I guess, dramatic about it. Dramatic without being substantial. I, I didn't research all the other networks and I didn't research all cable, but it was pretty clear that fundamentally what television news had figured out was that big, scary weather pictures um, were kind of thrilling to watch. And you could tell, mm -hmm. you could talk about them with great kind of drama and there was a little bit of there, but for the grace of God, go, I like, boy, I'm glad my town isn't underwater. But it just wasn't, they weren't covering the actual story of weather, which was really important in 2013. Um, and even more important today, which was that what was happening in weather was climate related. It wasn't just, you know, and there was no, I was, anyway, I, I mean, I'll, there'll be a link in the show notes and you can click on it yourself and go back to 2013 and, um, that being said, it's a, it's an intro to where we are today because that's the good. There's now good news. There's actual wake the fuck up good news. Yeah, but the the context though is also so noisy, right? So like I think when you think about coverage in 2013, you could actually hear it. Not that you don't hear stories about climate change, but in some ways the media landscape taints the coverage, especially now that we have so much fake news. Well, it, by the way, interestingly enough, and maybe I hadn't even put two and two together quite as logically, but the article that I'm comparing my 2013 article to is also a CJR article. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> which is, you know, which is great. Uh, and Kyle Pope, I don't know Mark... Uh, Hearts Guard, but I do know Kyle, and uh, and I'll just read you the, the the first graph, and then we can talk about it. Uh, this is from Columbia Journalism Review, November eighth, twenty nineteen. Some good news for a change about climate change. When hundreds of newsrooms focus their attention on climate, the climate crisis, at all at the same time, the public conversation about the problem gets better, more prominent, more information, more urgent. Da, 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 da. That, that, you know, yeah. essentially, finally, there's just so much weather. Now, meanwhile, 
having said that, if you watch television news, which I do on occasion, but not regularly, um, they're still happy to cover weather porn without necessarily, they don't really want to get ahead of making the analysis that hurricanes or extreme weather or forest fires or any of these things are the result. They, they never say if it's actually getting worse and if it's getting worse, why it's getting worse. But they are now saying the word climate change, which I think has been very hard for them. Mm -hmm. So when I think about uh, 1996, there was the movie Twister. You had your CJ article in 2013, and there was like another storm chaser kind of movie, I think, the following year. What you're basically saying is that uh, the media landscape is actually covering climate change in a way that is socially responsible, and they're doing it in sort of a way that's like it's almost like uh it's more effective because everyone's doing it and they're actually using the phrase climate change that's the biggest difference between 2013 and 2019 well i mean i you know i don't know whether it's a strategy or guilt or just inevitability but you know if you watch, for example, and I haven't done the, the research to follow it up, but I should. If you watch ABC, Diane Sawyer is now gone. Uh, and what you'll see is they will lead with a weather story two nights a week, sometimes three. Um, and, and I think, not to be, you know, kind of didactic about it, but I think it comes down to Okay, our lead story is either weather or Trump. Weather is kind of an every man, every person story. It doesn't scare anyone away. Trump, on the other hand, 50% of the viewers go, oh, wait, either I can't stand that story or I don't believe in your cover. Like, like, I think there's kind of an underlying yeah. ratings driver, which is we all have to deal with weather. Mm. So. That's interesting. So whether you believe in climate change or not, the weather is relevant to you. <laughs> yes, that's that's right. And if it's near you or near your relatives or near your family, you want to hear about it. And if it's not near to you or your relatives or your family or anyone you care about, then it's kind of like, boy, that's a terrible storm. I'm really glad it's not happening in my back backyard. Yeah. This might be like too much of a rabbit hole, but you know, when I when I see the pull quote in, in your article from this year, the goal is to make the climate story a routine part of daily news coverage rather than a subject addressed only on special occasions. I think what worries me though is then are we desensitizing ourselves to sort of the magnitude and sort of severity of of the coverage? Like that's actually I mean, you can say with climate change or even like gun control, it's like when it becomes so like new like news coverage as usual how does it does it have a numbing effect yeah fair enough. all right well and on that point let, let's go to the third little blip in this chapter and bring on our friend glenn zorpet to talk about this article that we dug up from ieee spectrum about how australia could prevent california wildfires and the and the ge blackouts using some australia technology so Glenn? All right, so Glenn joins us from IEEE Spectrum. Hey, Glenn, how are you? I am fine, thanks. So, so Alexa and I started out the show talking about the changing way in which the media is covering climate. And then we wanted to kind of get into the relationship between tech and climate issues. And this article obviously just hit the ball perfectly on, on the nose. So tell us a little bit about I, I mean, I, you don't read the headline tech from Australia very often. I mean, just to start with. Right. Yeah. Uh, Australia actually has a quite a proud heritage in technology, considering the size of the country. But yes, so this is this is a really interesting uh, issue in, in technology and climate because it's not it's not just about climate. It, it's a really heady witch's brew of climate and politics and sociology and demographic trends. The fundamental problem is California's population is shifting. People are moving further from cities. They're expand the state um, is is has a, a population influx and 
they're moving out into these areas where it's fairly remote. There, there are large forested areas that, um, that separate these, these uh, settlements from power generation. So you have power lines of various sorts running long runs through forests and, and other areas. You also have a state that is coming off a drought. Uh, it, it, there's, there's been years and years of a drought or drought-like conditions in California that have turned a lot of these forests into tinder, absolute tinder. These are very dry, dry forested areas for the most part, many of them. And on top of all that, once a year or so in California, you, you get these uh, meteorological phenomenon called Santa Ana winds and other dry, hot winds that blow across some of these areas, which uh, fan fires. So the, the issue of climate change is that climate change is exacerbating this latter part of the equation where, you know, you have you know, droughts and Santa Ana winds and so on. So no one knows absolutely for sure, but I think that a lot of people believe that climate change is exacerbating these uh, climactic conditions that give rise to these horrific wildfires. And, you know, as we talked about in the earlier segment, they also, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you wake people up, make dramatic television pictures so they're getting oh, covered yeah. more yeah so but yeah. but 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 here's what i don't get california particularly you know at san francisco being the tech center of the universe like i as i as i read about this tech i couldn't understand why it wasn't coming out of the valley like well there, there are a number of reasons one of the reasons is that australia has this problem as well it's not the exact same problem, but it's really similar. And in 2009, in a, there was a horrific incident that they refer to as Black Saturday uh, in a place that was, I believe, north northeast of uh, Melbourne, a suburb, a, a remote sort of mountain suburb, very pretty kind of uh, resort area, was hit with brush fires that were so bad that 100, more than 160 people were killed. I believe 159 were killed as a result of fires triggered by electrical uh, faults, electrical disturbances. So this was absolutely, obviously horrific. I mean, it, it's, you know, California has also had deaths linked to wildfires caused by electrical faults, but for 159 plus people to die in, in basically a weekend was um, a, a real national trauma in Australia. And the uh, to the credit of the Australian regulators and utilities, they went about systematically making sure that this kind of thing would never happen again. The, and, you know, Australia, they, they had the political will and they investigated the technology. They found some remarkable technologies that uh, can go a long way towards helping mitigate this problem, and they implemented it. So, you know, so it for, for those of us who are, are not technologists, explain, I can't even pronounce it, R-E-F-C-L, what, what is the tech? Right, they're called Rapid Earth Fault Current Limiters. So I want to first point out that this is only one of several technologies that have been applied in this area. This is a really interesting technology, but it's not the only one. And I also want to point out that Technology alone can't solve this problem. You know, we in this country, in America in particular, we have this idea. We like to think that, you know, technology can get us into problems, but it'll get us out of them too. And it's not. It's never that simple. And this is one of those cases where it's it's really not that simple. But technology does have an interesting role to play. It wouldn't be cheap. But before I say what it is, I just like to put it in perspective. California has too many miles of forests and lines running through forests. There's literally something like 200 and something thousand miles of lines running through forests in California. And half of that uh, is, is PG and E, I believe. So you can't possibly police all of these lines um, for vegetation. So in other words, it's before we understand how this technology works, you gotta understand what the problem is. The problem is that when you have a very dry land, like this, this tinder-like dry forested land and these hot winds, very it takes very little to start a fire. And one of the, the things that commonly start fires in this case are 
what are called electrical faults on the line. So these, these lines, they can be distribution lines or transmission lines, you're talking about tens of thousands or even 100,000 or more volts, 200,000 volts or whatever, if they're transmission lines. If a tree comes into contact with these lines, a dry, tinder-like tree, it can cause what's called a fault, and the arcing and sparking from the lines will set that tree on fire. That branch, the, the, the tree will then could start uh, a, a forest fire, a wildfire. But there are other ways too. You could have situations where the lines physically fall because the hardware is old or whatever, and the lines, when they hit the ground, the dry ground with, you know, tinder-like dried or dead vegetation, you get a fire that way. You could have conductors slap together and they could start a fire. So some of these are linked to lines just simply being old and and not in good, good repair or good condition. So there's one solution is just keep your lines in better repair. Another solution is spend a lot of time and money checking your lines to make sure that they're not overgrown with vegetation, that the vegetation isn't close to the lines. Utilities years ago used to spend a lot of money on keeping vegetation and trees and so on from touching these lines. And, th and that's a great way to do it. Um, however, California is in a situation where there are simply too many lines to really, to do too many miles of lines for this to be realistic. And as I say, it's exacerbated by people moving further and further from densely urban areas into these remoter areas where they can only be reached through lines that have to go through these these forests. Right. And so um, PG&E right now is just shutting down, like the, their current solution is to just black out chunks of right. California in advance of a forest fire. They have no way really of, of even coming close to guaranteeing that there won't be fires other than this, or they wouldn't be doing it. I mean, before it, it's before we you know get too angry at PG&E, it should be pointed out that utilities often have little or no control over the conditions in these forests. I mean, some of them are federal lands or state lands or other things where, you know, they, they don't necessarily control the way these forests are kept or the trimming that's done. I mean, I'm not trying to absolve them, but, you know, some of these issues just get lost in the... All right, so, um, so before we run out of time, though, explain the tech. <laughs> okay. so, we want... One, the interesting tech, the one that you mentioned, these rapid earth fault current limiters, actually are fascinating because they, they're, on a, they're based on a technology that was actually invented by a German engineer in 1914. And, and the idea was is that he noticed that under, you know, you could use electrical coils or, or inductors, like a large electrical coil or an inductor. And you could, if you had a resonance in this coil, in its magnetic field, and it was coupled to the electrical field of the line, you could dump the power from the line or shunt it over to another line incredibly quickly. How quickly? You're talking about like tens of milliseconds. And this is the kind of speed you would need to prevent a fire from breaking out from a fault in a line. Literally 100 milliseconds is not fast enough. So this is what's interesting about this technology is that you need incredibly high speed, you, at incredibly high speed, you need to dump over hundreds of amperes to another line, say, which is not being subject to fault because of a tree or something else. And this technology can do it. It was developed in Australia. Well, it was developed for overhead lines in Australia at a, at a very high cost. And I want to point out, too, this is not cheap. This technology works. It's been shown to work, although it can only work on about 30 percent of the lines in the PG&E distribution network that's, you know, at risk. They've, according to a calculation I saw. I mean, there are other technologies, too, that might mitigate in some of the other ones. Basically, in my opinion, what this is eventually going to require is a combination of these technologies, much tighter monitoring uh, of the vegetation and tree trimming and that sort of thing. It might require burying some overhead lines. I mean, once you bury a line, it's pretty much entirely safe, you know, but it's going to be, uh, but I should also point out that burying lines, transmission, distribution lines is very expensive. So, you know, none of these solutions are really cheap, but maintaining your lines, replacing old or decrepit lines, tree trimming and monitoring, uh, you know, assiduous tree trimming and monitoring, these tech, high technology solutions we're talking about, and even burying some lines, you know, 
that's basically what they're doing in Australia, and, it, and it's had a pretty beneficial effect. Um, and it's probably that is probably what's going to to ultimately happen with PG and E. Right, so, so Alexa, make a note. The next time we want to talk about electrical lines, it's not a six-minute segment because it's super co- – I, I, see, I thought you were just going to put a button on this and go, they solved it. It's all good. We just spend some money. But anyway, we we are out of time on this segment. But It's technology we're ever so simple. Indeed. Thank you, Glenn, for, for, My for your brilliant but slightly bewildering explanation of forest fires, which I'm now really nervous about. <laughs> My pleasure. All right. All right, so moving on to this new potential economic windfall. So Alexa, if Google called you and said, listen, your data is so interesting, we'd like to pay you 10 bucks a day for it. Would you go, sure, send me a check? And the, the devil is in the details, but in general, more control over what data is used for and obviously having a financial incentive to relinquish that data. Uh, yeah, sure. So directionally. Yes. So this came from a story that I wrote for uh, Media Post a couple of weeks back about what's happening in California. So California has enacted the California Consumer Privacy Act, CCPA. Um, and while it, if you don't live in California, might not seem to affect you, it turns out it actually, much like GDPR, really does because California is so do- damn big that most of the tech companies are going, yeah, we're going to, for the first time, actually start to think about privacy and having to negotiate with consumers to get access to their data in a very different way. And I found it just thrillingly exciting. Like, There were so many things that I was thinking about. Like, One, is California big enough of a market and does it house enough tech where it's not worth creating specific like algorithms, rules and and product provisions for the state where it's like, okay, they have to they have to figure out California that it actually is just gonna carry over everywhere else. Well, I mean I think, I mean, you you're more in the tech world day to day than I am, but my sense is that, you know, if it's happening in California, you could spend a lot of cycles if you're Google building a you know, a geofenced version of your site for California, but you kind of know it's going to, you know, I think Colorado is considering it. It's going to roll out like like personal mm-hmm. information. It, this next chapter is going to be consumers controlling personal information. It seems pretty inevitable. 10,000 percent. When I was in uh, Europe, it amazed me how um, explicitly opt in everything was when I was using the internet. It was incredible. Like on a day-to-day basis, I was constantly pruning what sites would access and uh, what they couldn't. And it actually spoiled me because um, at first I felt inconvenienced, but then I realized, I was like, oh, this is just, this is so powerful. And so that's actually what this article reminded me of, that, which is we're, we're behind Europe. So, so sure. give us a specific example of something that you clicked on and how you had to give it make decisions about what you were going to share i mean it was it was everything like you you can imagine that when you're just surfing the web you might hit 12 websites and imagine every single website telling you hey we're sending your data to google analytics hey we're sending your data to mix panel hey we're sending your data to mailchimp and our email service provider like to actually see almost like a nutrition label for a website and sort of the uh, uh, like sort of where where uh, where your data is feeding other third parties. Um, it was interesting. So so was, but does it end up just being like signing the the checkbox at the end of every software you install? I mean, is it is it I mean, did you make a judgment or did you just go? Yes, 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 yes. I think uh, in some cases I did, in some cases I I didn't. Like for example, if you were, say I was like buying tickets or uh, I don't know, like railroad tickets or something like that. When I buy tickets on Amtrak, I just I buy them and I go from A to B. Um, here I was, it was like I had to pause and think and say, hmm, do they really need to store 
this information. Interesting. Interesting. Well, I, I, um, I think that if enough people say no, then the next thing is going to be, we have an offer for you. Click this button and we'll give you, you know, a, you know, 10% off on all purchases on the site if you'll share your information with us. Like, yeah, I mean, in your article, when you talked about getting retargeted for dishwashers, yeah. even after you made the purchase, I mean, that's a, a great example of how we don't have a way to contain the data unless we actually have a system to explicitly ask, like very regularly. So just to bring listeners up to speed, I wrote an article called Get Me Get Me a Steve Bot. And essentially, after trying to buy a dishwasher and then buying one and finding that for months after, the not very smart targeting of the internet would continue to try and sell me dishwashers. Like there wasn't anywhere in my apartment to put a second dishwasher. It wouldn't matter how cheap it was. I just didn't, I had one. And I wanted to have a robot that I could teach to go out to the internet and say, hi, Steve's looking to buy Thanksgiving, you know, fixings for a holiday. We'd be interested in these kinds of foods. Steve's not interested in a dishwasher. He has one. Like, and, and so the Steve bot would essentially become my, you know, avatar to go out and tell people that wanted to give me discounts or bargains or offerings that I am in fact shopping for something. And it made me think about, this will sound like a long time ago for our younger listeners, but like, like early, early, early on, Seth Godin kind of made his career on this whole idea of permission marketing. Can I tell you this? Can I share this with you? Can I, would you be, and, I, and I've always thought that that was the, the, the white hot promise of the internet that has never come true. So I think personal information permissions might actually trigger that. I think it was, I, we, we thought it would come true, I think with the rise of social media and this idea of conversations actually creating a place and an opportunity to ask, right? Like that's, that was sort of like 2007, 2008. But we kind of skipped over that and media, like social media, just became paid media all over again. Like we can't actually have a conversation with robots and algorithms. Well, you can, but they generally just tell you what you want to hear. Right. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I was thinking about it the other day. It's like, you know, when you go into a store and you put on a jacket or a pair of shoes and the salesperson goes, oh, that looks great on you. And if you're smart, you know, way in the back of your head that that's just a sales trick. Like, like they could be thinking secretly, God, why would she ever buy that? But they're never going to think that, that looks awesome on you. You know, that's a that's a perfect color for you. But mm -hmm. I'm not sure how I'm going to feel when our when a robot tells me that. Mr. Rosenbaum, you look great in that jacket, sir. <laughs> I mean, ads do that by following you around. Yeah. Like they're trying to remind you like, oh, you want that thing. It can also be creepy when there's like a social media manager on a Twitter account and you post about something that you want online and then they reply to you and say like, go get the, go get the jacket, Steve. Yeah. Like that can also feel really creepy. Too. Yeah, no, there's definitely, we're in stalker land for sure. All right, we, we have time for just one more chapter, uh, but I definitely don't want to miss it. Um, there was this terrific uh, and really eye-opening article about the New York Times. Um, and there was also a, a podcast, uh, a terrific. The Daily. Yeah, what? It, the Daily. No, no. Well, no. I was. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I was thinking of there was there was a, a spectacular Vox podcast with Kara Swisher, uh, and in it, one of the one of the one of the leaders on the digital side of uh, of of the New York Times talked about the 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 data behind the Daily. And um, it was just um, very eye-opening. And well, here you, you, I'll, I'll tell you about that. But let's start with what, what did you think of the Mark Thompson piece uh, in the Neiman Lab Post? So I've been feeling so many things about the New York Times as of late, and so um, I don't know. I mean, this is this is for me where I just feel sad because the New York Times has been sort of I don't know probably. <laughs> I was five years old my mom like almost a tradition a staple in my household like 
my mom teaching me how to read the New York Times and like uh, teachers in high school showing me how to fold it on the subway and how to understand like an A1 story on the homepage. Um, to actually have all of this scrutiny around the New York Times and to actually see all of the places where it's failed us and is failing us. I don't know. I'm kind of, and generally, I'm just like sad. Yeah, I don't know. I, th- I thought Thompson was was pretty straight up about kind of like the direction it's going in and the, the shift toward more more content and how people pay for it. I, I don't know. I um, uh. I thought it was fairly. You're more optimistic about it. I'm not as I'm not as negative on it as some people are. Like I know a lot of friends who've canceled their subscriptions in recent years, and you know I do think that digital transformation and just media in general has been just a rough ride, right? Over the last you know ten plus years now. Um, Be- it doesn't mean though that like we shouldn't hold them to a higher standard rough ride because it was easy before that or you just weren't you just weren't aware of it um i mean i was i was not aware of it i wasn't born necessarily yeah i think i think the media (laughs) i i think the whole concept of media business you know is challenging and i think the new york times is that so for those of you listening the Neiman Labs uh, article we'll also have in the show notes. It's, uh, I, I think it's, in, it's not only do I think the Times is managing the transition really well um, with some bumps in the road that we could talk about, but I also think um, they, they're setting a good example for other media, legacy media companies to understand that, you know, if you give away too little, that's bad. If you give away too much, that's bad. You know, I mean, they're, they're, the part of the conversation about the daily, which is something of an addiction for people that listen to it every day, is if they started charging for it, a dollar a day, a dollar a week, 85% of their, some big percentage of their audience would come along. Because it's think, because it's so good. I, think I agree with that. No, I agree with that. I mean, I, I listen to the daily and it's, I think consumers are willing to pay as sort of a business operator, I just don't understand how you can make these calls around sort of the product, the packaging, the pricing, the distribution um, with any degree of certainty. It's just this wild, wild west. And I, I again, I, 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 my takeaway from all of it is like, yes, in some ways, the New York, the New York Times is leading and they're tripping over themselves in the way and they're creating more and they're introducing more in different formats, which gives us more to sort of scrutinize in the process. Um, I just think like there's no, there's no business model in media that is going to completely satisfy everyone. And with that note, uh, I think we will, we will, we'll save a larger deep dive into the New York times for another day and we have more time because it's definitely, there's a lot of data. What what was the the the, the podcast itself, the Peter Kafka um, Vox podcast, Recode. Recode podcast was uh, terrific and had all kinds of chewy data. And I made some notes, but we didn't have, we don't have time for it today. So with that, we'll jump off. See you again next week for episode 104. Ooh, 104. <laughs> See you, Steve. <laughs>